This episode is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Whether you love true crime or comedy, celebrity interviews or news, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue. And guess what? Now you can call them on your auto insurance too with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. It works just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance, and they'll show you coverage options that fit your budget. Get your quote today at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. If you're a last-minute gift shopper, then Instacart is your holiday rescue app this season. No more tracking packages, no more trips to the post office, and no more Christmas gifts arriving in February. Instead, you can just download Instacart to order gifts like beauty, tech, and gourmet goods from local stores and get them delivered in as fast as one hour. Plus, right now, you'll get free delivery on your first three orders. This offer is valid for a limited time. $10 minimum per order. Additional terms apply. Must be 21 plus to purchase alcohol where available. Saturday. Christmas comes early. Unbelievable. Welcome to this incredible scene. Bills. To the end zone. Chargers. It's a touchdown. An exclusive NFL game. This is fantastic. Live in primetime. Wow. Only on Peacock. With a Christmas gift to their fans. They're having some fun now. Bills versus Chargers. Saturday, 7.30 Eastern. Exclusively on Peacock. It's time. It's time. Time to get in the zone. Time to get in the zone. With the 49ers web zone. This is the No Huddle Podcast with Al and Brian. 49ers web zone, No Huddle Podcast, a part of the Odyssey Network. I am Brian. He is Al. And we are thrilled to be joined by Odyssey NFL insider Jason LaConfora host of the Odyssey original podcast in the huddle with Brian Baldinger and Carl Dukes covering the entire NFL. Jason, thanks so much for your time today. Hey, thanks for having me guys. Should be a heck of a ball game. It is, it is, uh, it is shaping up to be arguably the game of the year. Uh, The two best teams in the NFL, at least currently facing off. And you know, the Ravens have, uh, Jason, the Ravens have added weapons for Lamar Jackson this year. Uh, They've got OBJ. They drafted Zay Flowers. uh, But they also added uh, a new offensive coordinator in Todd Monken. They moved away from uh, someone that we know very well in Greg Roman. Um, How important do you feel that that move, that move from Greg Roman to Todd Monken, has been for Lamar and the offense as a whole? Well, I I think it had to happen. Um, the other thing had run its course, you know, they, they did revolutionize the NFL for a period of time, but then, you know, things got a little static. They got a little dry. Um, Greg Roman honestly got a raw deal in a lot of ways. I mean, they, they did a horrible job of allocating resources to the offense, not just even wide Mm -hmm. receiver in general, but the offense as a whole during most of Greg Roman's run here, um, he didn't have much of a deck to deal with. And then they also um, an offensive line that in 2019, everybody, you know, can make a case for a pro bowl fell in into some disrepair as well. And, you know, Ronnie Stanley has missed a lot of football the last four years and he's not playing very good football right now either. Uh, so yes, like the, the, they had to get shed their skin a little bit and get another voice in there and somebody else with Lamar and give Lamar a chance to grow in another way because Greg Roman, you know, the system is the system and he's, he's not going to be super malleable. He was there for a particular reason to try to win a perfect, a a certain way. And they Mm -hmm. couldn't get to the promised land. And um, obviously Lamar was going through his contract situation. And I think they had a pretty good idea that he was ready for a different sort of uh, look offensively. And so they finally, to your point, threw some money at the wide receiver position, kept, using key draft capital on the wide receiver position, even though it hasn't borne much fruit for them for the totality of their franchise's existence. Uh, <laughs> and it's a different thing. And it's a, it's a more interesting thing from a passing standpoint. Uh, and, and Lamar has grown in a lot of ways, but as much as they rolled up all these points and, and certain weeks rolled up all these yards, uh, there's still a lot of inefficiencies in it. And unfortunately they're dealing with some significant injuries again. So um, they've got to figure out another thing here, right? At first it was life without Mark Andrews. Now it's life without Mark Andrews, life rotating four offensive tackles, 
and life without Keaton Mitchell, who had really brought energy and and a dynamic thrust to this run game uh, with some elite speed. And he could take a broken play and take it to the house. And now they yeah. got to figure out what it's like without him because, unfortunately, he suffered a, a pretty significant uh, knee injury last week. Yeah, that Mitchell injury was rough, you know, for a lot of reasons. And, and I thought he was the weapon with Lamar back there that c- could have really changed the tide for, for the Ravens because he was so Absolutely. explosive. And, and you look at – you mentioned the past sort of disappointments they've had in the playoffs, the Ravens. Lamar is 1-3 in, in the playoffs. He's got three TDs, five interceptions. And even John, John Harbaugh hasn't won a playoff game since 2014. I, I know you have your finger on the pulse there in Baltimore, Jason. Is there is there pressure on them right now? Do they have to make a run this year? I mean, uh, there's pressure. There's certainly they know what the bar is and the expectations here, and they know they haven't come close to it. Like, is there pressure from a job security standpoint? No. Like, nobody's talking around here like they are in Pittsburgh. Now, I get it. This team has 11 mm-hmm. wins and that is seven. But, yeah, if you go back to 2012, the last time the Ravens won a Super Bowl, the Ravens and Steelers got a whole lot in common in terms of true signature wins. And I don't think either coach should be in trouble. And I don't think either is, but the one here, no. I mean, as long as Steve Bashotti owns this team, no, like Eric DaCosta's good, uh, John Harbaugh's good. Now, I think Steve Bashotti's, I mean, two years from now, three years from now, is he still owning this team? I don't think so. Um, mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, I, I, there's really none of that. I mean, other than, there, you know, the pressure that always exists, which is, you know, You've won Super Bowls around here before. You 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 got it done with the quarterback. Um, it's time to start creating some deep playoff runs. That's been the objective for a while. Uh, but I mean, look, like both their coordinators are probably going to interview for head coaching jobs. Lamar's a finalist. You know, is going to end up being one of the top vote getters for MVP. Um, you know, uh, they they've got holes on their roster. They've got things they need to address, but. All in all, as an organization, I think they're in a pretty good place. Yeah, and, you know, the 49ers made a pretty big trade midseason last year in 2022. They brought uh, a guy named Christian McCaffrey uh, mm-hmm. over to to the team from, from the Carolina Panthers. But the Ravens made a, a big trade of their own when they, when they went and got Roquan Smith from the Chicago Bears. How much of a difference has he made to this Ravens defense because they've given up the least amount of points in the league. Is is he kind of the linchpin for McDonald's scheme, or uh, is it just kind of uh, right place, right time? No, he's, he's got a lot to do with it. His arrival definitely uh, coincided with the ascent of this defense. Uh, it, it really, you know, it, it's allowed them to be a two-linebacker defense than a three. You know, before they were trying to figure out what is Patrick Queen, you know, and they also drafted Malik Harrison in that draft like in the third round, a pretty high pick. And, you know, mm-hmm. I think the thinking was, well, Bowser will be, um, you know, a strong side guy and Malik will be the middle linebacker because they lost C.J. Mosley a few years before the free agency of the Jets. And, you know, maybe Queen is uh, the will or we'll sort that stuff out. And then really, I mean, Bowser hasn't played much football the last two years. Patrick Queen didn't really ascend until they got Roquan Smith, who's brought out the best in Patrick Queen. And at the same mm-hmm. time, they're they're gathering all these defensive backs, and how do we get them on the field? Well, it's great. Now we only need two linebackers on the field to do a better job than three we're doing. And so that's where Kyle Hamilton steps in. And um, until Marcus uh, Williams got hurt, these guys were about 85% of the time that they, they would have 75 to 80% of the time. Uh, the last three, four weeks, they'd have three safeties on the field. I mean, that was their base. So now they've got to recalibrate that a little bit. But, yes, it gives them tremendous flexibility. Um, He's been a perfect – he settled everybody down. He's been the the perfect central nervous system, the perfect interconnective tissue between the D-line and the the back end. Uh, Leadership, intangibles, all that. Everything, all the pieces fit into place. He's a force multiplier. Now, on his own, you know, outside of some games with tackles, he's not going to light up the box score. He's Mm -hmm. not going to, you know, he's not going to have five tackles for a loss. He's not going to have sacks. He's not going to have a ton of passes defensed. Um, So it's not really, it's not going to show up like that. But if you watch this team play 
and you saw them play before he got here. Uh, he really has has been the glue, um, and and they play in his like he's a he's a tone setter. Um, his physicality, his early game approach, uh, and certainly they're you know they, they've they've ascended across the board. They're still not great defending the run, um, not nearly as good as they were a year ago, uh, mm-hmm. and they're not perfect. And they haven't faced a team like this offensively, especially not on the road, like not even close. So yeah. we'll learn a lot about both of these units, right? Because the 49ers, as great as they are, um, they haven't seen a defense quite like this. They haven't seen an opponent quite like this. Yeah, and that leads me to my next question, Jason. So when we're talking this year about, you know, the Niners are good and it looks like they're going to make a deep playoff run, who worries you? And a lot of people said Philly, Philly. For me, I keep, I keep telling Brian, the, the Ravens scare the hell out of me. Just because they, like you said, they have such a good defense. They have Lamar. When you look at this game, you mentioned the Niners' offense. What kind of challenges do you think Shanahan and his system posed to Mike McDonald and the Ravens' D? Oh, um, plenty. Uh, these guys have struggled. Again, inside runs have been a problem for them. Draws, delayed handoffs, um, teams that are a little creative attacking the A gap has given them problems. I'm sure the 49ers have watched plenty of the film from when the, the Ravens were out in Arizona and Connor mm. was out at the time and DeMarcado had had some fun at their expense. Uh, even teams that don't run the ball that well, Cincinnati, ran the ball pretty well on the Ravens. Uh, and then if you – the outside runs are a problem as well. Um, and if you drill down on the Ravens against pitch plays – they allow 6.1 yards per play, 28th in the NFL. And as we know, San Francisco is doing a whole lot of that stuff. And they average 5.8 yeah. per carry when they pitch it out there, whether it's Debo or, or McCaffrey or whatever. Uh, Ravens have not been, even with Roquan Smith helping them in coverage, they haven't been awesome defending running backs, especially in the red zone. And I think they're like 27th in the league in completion percentage to running backs. Uh I think they're going to be uh, there's going to be a lot of torque, and they're going to be sort of going to be pulled in a lot of different directions here, in terms of of what they focus on and who they key on. Uh, and then in the back end, um, Marlon Humphrey's not having a great season. Marlon Humphrey hasn't been that healthy, uh, and Sean McVay and Matt Stafford threw it Marlon Humphrey mercilessly in the fourth quarter of that game in Baltimore two weeks ago, and I I am sure that. You know, uh, Kyle has spent plenty of time looking at that. Now, the Jags, that game was kind of weird. You know, we come to find out Lawrence was concussed in the second half of that game. Uh, Mm -hmm. They don't have the passing game that the Rams have or the 49ers have. But Marlon Humphrey really should be a slot corner at this stage. But I don't think he's going to be playing in the slot here. And and, uh, he's he's had difficulties in coverage, to say the least. So – it's going to be – and look, they're edge rush. They lead the league in sacks. And you can look at a lot of metrics and they'll tell you that these guys are off the charts. And, and okay. But Clowney's starting to look his age and Van Noy's starting to look his age. And David Ajabo, who they drafted to come in and help this team, is not going to play any football this year. And Tyce mm-hmm. Bowser's not playing any football this year. And they're pretty thin on the edge. Adafi Owe is the one pass rusher who generates the most heat but he doesn't finish. He couldn't finish in college. Um, he's creating stuff and they're not picking it up. So really it's a one man gang right now. You know, it just matter BK and, and Travis Jones have 15 of their last 30 quarterback hits. Those are two interior defensive linemen. Um, wow. They're going to have to ramp up the edge stuff big time. And I, I on, on the road against, you know, this offense where the ball's coming out quickly and those guys are going to have their hands full in the run game. Um, I think the Ravens' season tack, sack totals and sack rates um, belie what's really going on there right now, which is Matabike's winning battles. Jones comes in for him, wins a few battles, but I have I have questions about they, – they don't have a dude. Matabike's a dude. They don't have any other yeah. dudes up front. Um, and when they play better teams and we get deeper into the season and Clowney's legs start to go a little bit and Van Noy's legs start to go a little bit, there's not a whole lot of there there. Speaking of defenses that <clears throat> may have displayed a little bit of a weakness 
you know, the 49ers just gave up 234 yards yeah. on the ground to the Cardinals last week. And the Cardinals are a good running team, uh, but they were also missing Javon Hargrave and Eric Armstead. Uh, prior to that, San Francisco had the number one rush defense, but you could also argue that the way that they've been playing this season with the amount of uh, second half leads that and 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 the size of those leads yeah. that they've gotten, teams are having to abandon the run to 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 pass to catch up. The Cardinals didn't abandon the run, uh, even though they were down multiple scores and you know again scored or racked up two hundred thirty four yards. Um, do you feel like this San Francisco rush defense is not as good as the numbers belie simply because of that? And do you think that's something that the Ravens are going to either a look to exploit or b be able to exploit even with Keaton Mitchell uh, now out of the game? Whether it is or not, I don't care. They they better run the ball forty times if, if they want to stay in this football game and they want to keep the, their quarterback um, from suffering another December injury. Uh, they they have the second half of the Jacksonville game is who they have to be, especially in this game. Um, and they ran 30 times for over 200 yards in this just in the second half. I don't know that it'll be that robust and bountiful against this defense, but they need to find out. They need to stick with it. Um, you know, Todd Munkin likes to get cute on first down and a lot of play action deep shots. Most of them don't get completed because they're not a downfield passing game. But like, yeah. no, that needs to be if you're throwing on first down it better be an RPO and the ball better be coming out quickly. Um, again, they're rotating their tackles that they, 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 I mean, it's, it is what it is. I mean, they're paying Ronnie Stanley 20 million bucks and he's spending a quarter of the snaps on the sidelines while Patrick McCarry plays in his spot. And Morgan wow. Moses is done and they're, they're alternating him with a kid, a project, Daniel Fa'alele, a six, eight kid who is just kind of figuring it all out. But like, they don't trust these guys. They just don't. It's just, it, and they should um, yeah. And against this group, forget about it. So uh, they have to be committed to running the football. And Lamar will put on a show and he'll run 15 times or more and he'll probably butt up against 100 yards. And, you know, Gus Edwards will, will have to run the ball 12 or 15 times. I don't care if it's 2 7 to carry, they're going to have to stick with that mm -hmm. um, for a bunch of reasons, including the fact I just told you their edge rushers are old and they're starting to look old and that defense isn't built to be on the field all that long. Um, they need to get back to being a big time of possession team. And yeah, losing Keaton Mitchell, the home run hitter hurts. Justice Hill's a capable back. He's he's the, the next guy up in terms of that Mr. Outside, the guy who can gain the edge and, and do some things out there. And Gus is Mr. Inside. Uh, there, there's got to be a role for, for all of them. Um, that's, that's how they're, if they're going to go deep in the playoffs, that, that's how they're going to do it. You know, it's not going to be because Odell Beckham's catching, you know, eight balls for 100 yards every week. It's right. not going to be because Isaiah likely is as good as he's looked is doing what Mark Andrews can do. Um, it, it's it's just, again, especially with their problems at the tackle position. Like, and on the road against this team on a short week, nah. Yeah. Run the ball. Jason, who do you think's winning this game? I think the 49ers are winning this game. I, I think it's not just who you play. It's when you play them and where you play them. And I, I don't think those things line up very, very well for the Ravens. Jason, Again, appreciate the time. Thank yeah, you. Thank you so much. Injuries, all the above. You got it, guys. Thanks, right, Jason. Appreciate you. Thank you, Jason. Bye. All right. That was Jason Lock and Fora, uh, Odyssey NFL Insider. Make sure to follow In the Huddle on your Odyssey app or subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. As the weather gets colder, the NFL offers stay red hot at FanDuel right now. New customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. You've been thinking about joining. There's no better time than right now. We're in the sports solstice, if you will. Spreads, props, totals, and more. Every sport on the planet is playing, and you can get it at FanDuel.com. So visit FanDuel.com slash 2400 and get involved with the NFL season. It's FanDuel, 
official partner of the NFL. Must be 21 plus and present in select states. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino, LLC. First online real money wager only. $5 pregame money line wager required. $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued as non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit fanduel.com slash RG in Colorado, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Virginia. Call 1-800-NEXT- or text next step to 53342 in Arizona, 1 888 789 7777, or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut, 1 800 9 with it in Indiana, 1 800 522 4700, or visit ksgamblinghelp.com in Kansas, 1 877 770 STOP in Louisiana, visit mdgamblinghelp.org in Maryland, visit 1 800 gambler.net in West Virginia, or call 1 800 522 4700 in Wyoming. Hope is here. Visit gamblinghelplinema.org or call 800 800- 327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts or call 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY in New York. Brian, I got a couple things. I got something I want to talk about. Yeah. I didn't tell you this before. There's just, there's just something on my mind. There's something Let's I want to get off my chest. I, All want, right. I want to do that. But before I do, I want to thank Panini. Um, if you follow me on Twitter, you know I just did a giveaway. I gave away some Panini legacy cards if you're watching this or the clips. Well, you're not watching it because it's a podcast, but if you watch the clips, um, I got the Panini Legacy box here. I want to thank them for sending that to me. I'm going to try to do some more giveaways for fans. Check out Panini. Check out their stuff. Their cards are awesome. There's autographs in there, numbered cards. It's really cool stuff. So I want to thank them for sending me that. And <clears throat> we'll get as much out to the fans as we can. All right. Here's what's, here's what's on my mind, Brian. Here, here's what I've been thinking about, okay? Everybody, everybody, not everybody, but there's just enough of this, well, Brock Purdy is only good, Al, because, you know, he's got all these great people around him. And the, when Trent Williams was out and when Debo Samuel was out, he 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 didn't play as well. So it's just I've just been really thinking about it. And here's I guess here's the here's the way I want to put it to people. And this is probably the simplest way that I can do it. When you look at any great team. The people are usually good and the players usually excel because of the people around them. This is football. This isn't baseball. This isn't basketball. This isn't LeBron. I can blow by somebody and take over the game. This isn't a pitcher who can strike out 18 people. It's a team game. You do have some quarterbacks sometimes who can be transcendent. I think we've seen Patrick Mahomes do that. Mm -hmm. But the reason the 49ers are the 49ers is because – Trent Williams makes Christian McCaffrey better. And Christian McCaffrey yeah. makes Brock Purdy better. And Debo, Ayuk, and Kittle, they all make each other better. And Chase Young has made has helped Nick Bosa. And Javon Hargrave has helped Eric Garment. And it's just the way it is, down the line, down the line. And when you look at even McCaffrey, McCaffrey is having an all-time season. Yeah. Not only for the 49ers, but for the NFL. This guy is going to maybe have 2,100, 2,200 all-purpose yards. He's going to lead the league in rushing. He might score the way Kyle uses him. What's he got? 20 total TDs right now. What's he going to yeah. score? 20, 25 this year? I mean, he's having an all-time season. You can make the argument, though, Brian. Part of the reason McCaffrey is having an all-time season is because he's on the 49ers. Yeah. <laughs> because he's yeah. got all these great players around him. Because he's with Kyle Shanahan. And no shade on McCaffrey. who I, I, I will sit and talk for hours about how good I think Christian McCaffrey is. But in that three-game stretch where the Niners struggled, 11 carries for 43 yards, 15 carries for 45 yards, 12 for 54. He struggled, too, during that time. In the game yes. before that against Dallas, he only had 51 yards on 19 carries, and that was a game where they threw the ball better. So I'm tired of, like, people just they want to have the hot take. They, they don't want to give people credit. Football is a team game. Yes, the 49ers have a lot of good players who are having amazing seasons. They may have four 1,000-yard scrimmage people and a 4,000-yard passer this year, which hasn't been done, I think, since the Colts in 2004. So when the Colts in 2004, they had Harrison and Stokely and Wayne and Edron James and Peyton Manning. And Dallas Clark. They all made each other better because they were great. And it's the same thing with the Niners. Like, stop nitpicking this. If McCaffrey wins the MVP, great. If Purdy wins the MVP, great. You know what? They're both deserving. But they're on a great team. And usually who people win the MVP, they're on a great team. It just is what it is. So I'm tired of the nitpicking. I'm tired of whatever. The Niners have all these guys and just deal with it. They're going to make each other better. And as long as they're all on the field together and healthy, they're going to be really, really tough to deal with. 
Well, and, and, and here's the thing, right? Like we talk about Christian McCaffrey and Christian McCaffrey has been great. And he like Brock Purdy is, you could say significantly better than I'm not going to say Brock Purdy has been significantly better than Dak because they're pretty, they're fairly similar, but Chris McCaffrey has been significantly better than, than the next closest in, in rushing, which is, I believe Raheem Mostert, I believe is, is number two, right? Running in the same system that Christian McCaffrey mm-hmm. is. <clears throat> but if you go back to 2019, right? The, the, the year that the 49ers went to the Super Bowl, they didn't have a Christian McCaffrey, but they still had a running game that was dominant to the point of 2,305 yards on the ground and 23 touchdowns. Like, it, it, it's not like, it's not like Christian McCaffrey has all of a sudden given the 49ers a running game. They already had a running game. What Christian McCaffrey has given the 49ers is an even deadlier passing attack, which bodes well for Brock Purdy. And I was looking at this the other day. I thought it was interesting. You know, I, I've I've done this before where I, I kind of read off the numbers that where Brock Purdy currently is or what his numbers are projected to be versus the numbers that Matt Ryan put up uh, in 2016 with the Atlanta Falcons. And those numbers are very, 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 very similar um, in terms of yards, touchdowns. Um, the the only two areas where where Ryan would have an advantage is in total yards or passing yards by... Mm-hmm. I think again through projections right now, um, through I, I believe by 200 yards, and I think three more touchdowns, 38 to 35. Again, these are projected. Um, but if you look at uh, if you look at Matt Ryan's season or the Falcons in general that season, the Falcons were averaging 33.8 points per game, and and San Francisco is currently averaging 30.4, so they were averaging three points more per game. But Atlanta allowed 25 points per game that year, and S- and San Francisco is currently allowing only 16.7. So the difference between Matt Ryan and Brock Purdy is Brock Purdy has been sitting fourth quarters multiple games this season, and Matt Ryan never did because they weren't blowing teams out like this team is, right? They didn't have the defense that this 49ers team does. So all these numbers, right, the – 4,944 4, yards for uh, for Matt Ryan. Again, Purdy's projected. This is, again, just based on the number of yards he's thrown so far through 14 games. And then, so you take that average and then you multiply that by 17-game season and you get his projection. And he's projected, it's uh, 4,646. So 300 yards less, right? Um, 300 yards less with one more game, which seems, you know, n- to imply that it's not nearly as good. But again, Brock Purdy has sat fourth quarter significantly more than Matt Ryan ever did. Uh, and then 38 touchdowns to 35 touchdowns. Um, but the touchdown percentage is the same, 7%. Um, Brock Purdy is on pace for uh, two more interceptions than than Matt Ryan had. But his success rate is better. His yards per attempt are better. His... Um, QBR and his rating uh, are, or his rating is, is uh, almost similar, uh, almost exactly the same. So Matt Ryan was 117.1. I was going to say he's 117, uh, I thought, yeah. Brock Purdy is 116.9 um, yep. currently. Again, that's current. I can't, I can't project what that will be moving forward. Isn't, isn't Purdy 119 now? Didn't that go up? Am I wrong? It may have gone up. I, this was an, I'm the numbers I was pulling are, I think a a couple weeks old. So I actually do think you're right. I think he's at 119 now, which would be higher. But yeah, the thing that I thought was interesting is Matt Ryan accomplished all of that on 537 attempts. Brock Purdy is on pace through 17 games for 466. So almost a hundred less attempts to, to produce the same level of efficiency that Matt Ryan did. And to me, that's incredible. And that just, again, points to the historic, the historically significant efficiency that Brock Purdy is operating under. And, you know, you look at, 
you look at the league and you say it, it's been a down year. You know, Jimmy Garoppolo in 2019, if you look at just the raw stats, looked very similar, right? More interceptions, less touchdowns, same amount of yards, right? And and as a team, they were scoring 30 points per game in 2019. But also 2019, Lamar Jackson existed, right? So that's why Jimmy Garoppolo was never even in the conversation for MVP because mm -hmm. Lamar Jackson was a, was Superman in 2019. So it just wasn't even worthy of a conversation. There hasn't been a Superman this season, even if you even if you want to include Tyreek Hill or, or Christian McCaffrey. So to me, it, again, it's all about context. We're talking about 2023, right? When we talk about MVP, we're talking about just this season. And I, I just don't think you can point to anyone who has performed at the quarterback position better than Brock Purdy. And as Peter King, we talked to Peter King, and he said, right, the last 10 years, that award has gone to the quarterback of the one or two seed from either conference. Mm -hmm. Currently, again, as it stay, as it sits, that's Purdy, Dak, Lamar Jackson, and uh, Tua Tongovaloa. And of those four, I, I don't know that anybody has uh, really any case above Brock Purdy. Yeah, and it's just – We've gone over it so many times. He's 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 not thrown for 240 yards and one touchdown. He's right. doing things we haven't seen before. Right. He's having an elite season, a memorable season. Just enjoy it, man. Just just yeah. enjoy it. All right, Brian. Looking at this game, so I'm I'm a little bit surprised in the sense you, anybody who who knows me knows I've been like the Ravens scare the hell out of me. Mm -hmm. They they just do. They're the team that mm -hmm. probably scares me. I just feel like they present problems to the Niners now. Without Mark Andrews, without Keaton Mitchell, I'm a little less afraid on the offensive side and the Keaton Mitchell injury to me, some people may not even know who he is. Yeah. I thought he changed everything for the Ravens because he was a home run threat out of the backfield. And when you get Lamar Jackson back there and you have somebody like him, it just one play can change the game. And when right. he went out, I, I said that that could be the injury That's huge. as much yeah. as you wouldn't have thought it three months ago, that could be the injury even more than Mark Andrews that what that might derail them. Cause Isaiah likely is he's not Mark Andrews. But he's done a good job. Mm -hmm. it was on a Cordell Woodland today. Who's um, He's got a Ravens podcast, and he he is on 105.7 The Fan out in Baltimore, covers the Ravens. You know, he's in the locker room. Mm -hmm. And we talked today, and I was a little surprised, same as with Jason. They, they're talking about some some holes in this team. Yeah. And one of the things that he brought up, and the same thing Jason were, were, were the tackles. Ronnie Stanley is not healthy. Ronnie Stanley's been getting pushed back. He's not having a great season, and they're having issues on the other side as well. So, so the Niners can absolutely – take advantage there where i'm worried brian because you brought it up earlier if eric armstead and javon hargrave don't play I, all bets are off here to me because you yeah. saw the you saw the cardinals be able to run the ball in the niners what was it 224 they ran or Two, whatever it was 220 20 plus 264 yeah so that's I mean, it's a lot of yards and, and they look like they were getting yards when they needed to and we've seen the niners struggle to defend the run at other times I'm nervous as hell with that. That if, if Armstead and Hargrave are there, I feel great. Mm -hmm. If they're there in healthy play, if they're not, I'm a little bit worried. Yeah. But we'll see. On the edges, the Niners may be okay. We'll we'll see up the middle. Yeah, and then not only that, but Kalia Davis went on IR, um, and so you've lost yeah, another point, body. Yeah. yeah, you lost yep. another body there. Uh, they signed a guy today. Again, not a not a name. Uh, somebody asked Kyle Shanahan earlier this week about Ndama Um, mm -hmm. And he essentially said, like, we're not there yet. Um, I would be interested to see if if maybe <laughs> they look to bring him in. I know that he just visited with the Dolphins, uh, I think, yesterday. It was either yesterday or today. Um, so he is starting to get a little traction. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, he he's in that part of his career where he's going to sit out the majority of a season and then try and catch on with, some you know some uh contender uh which yeah, by the right, way yeah. why hasn't zach Ertz signed anywhere yet that seems weird but i forgot about him yeah i forgot that's... that he was even out there yeah because the yeah. niners were were sort of rumored there yeah and that's why i'm like that's weird like why hasn't he signed with anybody yet that was interesting. maybe he's not healthy i don't know could be but um but yeah so so the depth on the interior is is a problem um you know they have ty mcgill uh, who played well for them last year and, and played well against uh, Arizona. The one thing that I noticed and this, and, and again, I don't know if it's just a lack of 
playing together. But one of the things that I noticed last Sunday against the Cardinals is how many times I saw one of our or both of our defensive tackles on the ground. Like, not only like either blocked into the ground or like blocked into each other and tripping over each mm -hmm. other, things like that. And it really, like I said, it, it kind of felt like they just weren't used to being out there together and just used to being out there in general, you know, Kalia Davis, uh, Kevin Givens, right. They don't tend to play together, right. That mm -hmm. rotation tends to be Hargrave and Armstead. And then you're rotating in, you know, one or two guys. And that is usually Kevin Givens and Javon Kinlaw. Right. But now with the, the two that spearheaded out now, Kinlaw and Givens are like your one, your one and two. And now you've got guys that aren't used to playing like Kalia Davis, T.Y. McGill, things like that. Yeah, I, I think I think as long as one of Javon Hargrave and Eric Armstead plays, I, I feel better. Um, if neither one of them plays like you, that scares me a lot uh, because, you know, they looked piss poor defending the run last week against Carolina and I d Carolina Arizona mm -hmm. and I don't anticipate them being able to get out to such a lead like they did against Arizona that allowing 264 yards on the ground doesn't matter right they're not I don't think they're going to be able to blow out this Ravens team now with that being said I was surprised at the way that Jason talked about the defense specifically and essentially that while they are good, they are not dominant, right? right. They're not dominant on the edges, um, you know, on the interior is, is, is where they, they tend to, to be getting a lot of their pressure. And so, you know, you're going to have to have a good game from who I hope is John Feliciano and Aaron yep. Banks. Um, I think Feliciano has 100% earned the, the that spot, even if Burford is healthy. He, he needs, needs to, to play. Forward. Yeah. Great. Um, and so that worries me a little bit. But but again, I think, like he said, Kyle's going to watch film and see that they can get to the edges on this team. And if they can get to the edges, the interior doesn't matter as much. And so, um, yeah, I I was surprised to hear – Again, Jason, not be down on the defense, but I, I thought this defense had been performing, you know, as the as the best defense in the NFL. Um, and and it sounds like they're starting to leak oil a little bit. And so I, I would imagine Kyle Shanahan is such an incredible uh, game plan uh, implementer, right? He's He watches the film. He's going to find whatever your weaknesses are and and he's going to attack the shit out of them and yeah. it sounds like that is outside uh with marlon humphrey and that is on the edges in the run game and i would imagine we're going to see a lot of outside zone we're going to see a lot of tosses we're going to see a lot of jet sweeps uh yes. with debo we're going to see you know and and i think you're going to see if if they attack downfield it's going to be on the outside with brandon Ayuk and debo samuel and then i think if they're attacking the outside and it's, and it's effective, it's going to soften the middle. And then all of a sudden now you can see Kittle up the seam or, or whatever the case may be. I am a lot more confident after talking to Jason <laughs> than I Same. was before talking to Jason. <laughs> I felt, so I started my day today. Al Sacco wakes up in the morning and I, like I said, I went on a Ravens podcast. Yeah. We, we talked with Ryan Hensley today mm -hmm. and then we had Jason on and I woke up today. I feel better now that I did when I woke up because the Ravens people I've talked to, there's a hint of, you know, we're a good team, but there's some ways you can attack us in the defense. Yeah. I think this is, this is a McCaffrey and Debo game because yeah. of what we said with the running and what Kyle's going to do. I think Kyle's going to be pretty creative in the running game. Now, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier in the show or not, but McCaffrey and Debo are the only two players in the NFL with five plus rushing and receiving TDs that shows you how what the Niners can do in that running game. They can really diversify in that running game. Mm -hmm. They're really tough to mm -hmm. defend in that running game. And you look at the Ravens this year, they, everybody has been saying, you know, they have issues against the run. The Colts ran for 139 on them. That was a game the Ravens lost. Tennessee ran for a buck 29. The Cardinals ran for a buck 29. And then recently over the last five games, the Browns ran for 178. They beat them. The Bengals ran for 136. And the Rams 
who put up 31 points on, on the Ravens, ran for 128. That first drive against them, they, when the Rams came out, they ran basically that whole drive to get up. Yeah. So unless, unless something fluky happens where the Niners get down 14 points or something like that, I think it's McCaffrey. I think it's Debo. I think you're going to see, not that Debo's going to have 10 carries, but I think he's going to have right. three or four well-planned runs in there. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I feel good, man. And it's hard yeah. right now for me. This team to me, Brian, there's just 94 vibes to me yeah. with this team. So in the sense that I don't, they don't have a, they don't have a team they need to get over. Like the 94 team had to get over the Cowboys. The Niners just have to get over the hump of getting over the hump, right? Mm -hmm. Like they need to, get, they need to finish. They need to get a ring for this core. And I think they understand that. And it just feels that way for me this year. Like they just, they're just, they're kicking the shit out of people. Other than that three game stretch, which whatever, it happens to all teams throughout a season. Yeah. They're kicking the shit out of people. <laughs> yes. They seem like they have a purpose. And this is going to be, I think this could be a Super Bowl preview. I think this is a lot of ways the toughest game they played this year. I'm really interested to see how it pans out. Now, if they lose, am I going to go crazy? No, because again, this, we've seen this team have a rough yeah. stretch and bounce back because they're so talented. But I feel like they're going to win the game. And I feel like this is just, you know, again, God willingly barring injury. This is going to be a tough team to beat the rest of the season. As, as Johnny cash was wont to say, God willing and the Creek don't rise, right? Like as long as there's no injuries yeah. or anything like no that, tragedies. Type um, stuff. Yeah. That's uh, this team when healthy, I, I just, even the Ravens at, at the, at the same record of, of 11 and three, I just don't think they're anywhere near the caliber of this 49ers team regardless of what their records say. And I I agree with you. You know what I would love to see? I would what I would love to see is if the 49ers do win the Super Bowl uh which is being played in Las Vegas uh this this year. It comes back to by the way, it comes back to Santa Clara in 2026, 20, I think. 2027, something fairly soon. It's coming back to Santa Clara, which is fun. Four of the next, I think it's four of the next five Super Bowls are essentially in the Western uh, Western time zone. But I would love to see, just as a nod to Steve Young and that 94 team, I just want to see someone take that monkey off of Kyle Shanahan's back, right? Mm. It's not the quarterback this time. It's the coach. It's the head coach. That's, but a, great, that's someone, a great point. Someone needs to take that monkey off his back if they win that thing. I would love to see Dude. it. Dude, that's such a great storyline. When you look at yeah. what Kyle's kind of been through, so he has the not not that he was the head coach for the Falcon Super Bowl, but right. he was the offensive coordinator, and there were some play calls that maybe should have been different there. Mm -hmm. And he said, I remember reading an article where he said he walked in, there might have been a hotel room, and saw his family just like collapsed. Like that's how much it took out of him. You know what I mean? Yeah. He just broke down. And then he's the coordinator. Imagine what these Niners losses have taken out of him. Mm -hmm. You have the Super Bowl that you're up by ten in the fourth. Yeah. It looks like you might be able to finish it out. And then what happened there happened there. You have these NFC championship losses that have been, you know, whatever happened against the Rams, we have a drop yeah. pick. Um, and then last season, you don't even get to compete because your right. quarterback gets hurt. That's a great, that's the story right there. If Kyle gets back, get the monkey off his back because what's yep. going, we talk about Steve Young. Mm -hmm. Steve Young was going to be in a, he was an elite quarterback, but he yes. goes to legendary quarterback with the Super Bowl, right? You mm -hmm. win the championship. Mm -hmm. Kyle is going to go from, you know, great head coach to legendary. Great. Yeah. yeah, exactly. If he, once he gets a championship, you're talking hall of fame head coach for Kyle Shanahan. You are, you yeah. are, he's going to have 10 plus years here. He's already got a super bowl appearance in three NFC title title games. Mm -hmm. If he wins a title, you're talking a hall of fame coach. Yeah. That's how much is on the line for him. So that's a great yeah. point, man. I, th I think that has to, that has to be talked about a little more than it has been. Yeah. And also, uh, if if you haven't or anybody listening, um, Robert Mays of the Athletic Football Show on their uh, week four, we just did week 14, right? Week 14 recap. Um, he has about a five minute like rant on not rant because it was positive, but about Kyle Shanahan and just how mm -hmm. we are not talking enough about how goddamn incredible this guy is as an offensive innovator, a play caller, uh, a team builder, like all of it. We don't talk about it because we talk about 28 to three. We talk about yeah. 
you know, the fourth quarter against the Chiefs. We talk about the NFC Championship game against the Rams. We don't really talk about last year's NFC Championship game. There wasn't anything that they could do. No. Um, yeah. But we talk about those things rather than really recognizing just what it is that this guy has done. I mean, look, he has taken the last pick in the draft and has crafted a historically efficient offense with him. Like yeah. that, it, we don't talk about it because I think we're just spoiled with, with how good Kyle Shanahan is, is like, we don't even recognize it, but you know, he basically said like, once, once he wins that championship, then he starts to get talked about in the same breath as Belichick and Reed, Reed and yep. Walsh. And, you know, the guys that, the guys that we look to and go, those are those are the guys that we point to on the Mount Rushmore of NFL head coaches, and he's going to have an argument. And let's be perfectly honest. If they win a Super Bowl this year, they will be the favorites to win the Super Bowl next year. Absolutely. And if Brock Purdy is who he appears to be, right, and we won't know that until – he gets another contract. We talked about that a little bit with, with Ryan earlier today. You know, what is it going to look like? You know, are they going to have to give him a $50 million contract? I posited that Brock Purdy strikes me as the kind of guy that might not try and break the bank, you know, in order to continue to compete. Because to me, Brock Purdy seems to eat, sleep, and breathe football. Like, he just seems like a football guy, right? Like, you know, like we said, he's he's shopping with Cole's cash. Like he he has no he he has no care about his persona, his image, whatever. What he cares about is playing winning football. And so there's a part of me that wonders, like, is he I mean, he'll get broken off. I'm not saying that he won't, but mm -hmm. is he gonna get broken off like Jimmy Garoppolo got broke off, or is he gonna get broken off like Patrick Mahomes and Lamar Jackson and Justin Herbert and Joe Burrow. And, you know, basically again, whoever signs next is the biggest contract right. in NFL history type stuff. But if Kyle Shanahan wins multiple Super Bowls, especially with San Francisco, I mean, it's the, the, at that point you're going, he's top five, like you, you he's top five. <laughs> it just with his offensive innovation, you know, his, uh, his, his team building. And that's the other thing. He's an offensive minded head coach who sinks a shitload of resources onto the defensive side of the football. Yeah. And a lot of offensive, like I was listening to, uh, it might've, it, I, I do, this, this might hurt your feelings. I think I was, I was listening to dual threat, which is one of the ringer. That's the one with Nora Princiati and Steven Ruiz. Yeah. And they were talking, about, <laughs> but they were talking about, um, they were talking about, Kyle Shanahan and team building and, you know, his focus on the defensive side of the ball, which is uh, unique to, um, you know, unique to offensive minded head coaches. And they gave a, a, an anecdote about, um, let me back up. It was either, it was either dual threat with Steven Ruiz and Nora Princiati or it was candlestick chronicles with Chris Biederman and Kyle Matson. Those are the two that I listened to today. I can't remember now which one, but there was an anecdote about how Mike Martz, like Mike Martz didn't even ever want to draft a defensive player, right? Mike Martz just only wanted right. like wide receivers and, and skill position players, right? Cause that's, that was his side of the ball. And so I, I just think he's a unique, he's a unique coach in the NFL now. And, and all that's holding him back is that championship. And, and once he gets it, it's like I said, the way that we talk about him is going to change dramatically and his legacy is going to change dramatically. And so, yeah, like I said, who you know, I know a lot of 49er players listen to this podcast. So one of you guys, <laughs> <laughs> one of you guys, or somebody get this to a 49ers player. Uh, maybe Tabor Pepper. I don't know. It feels like this is a Tabor thing, but somebody please take that monkey off Kyle Shanahan's back if you guys win it all uh in, in February this this coming year. You know, they're they're on a run right now. You think back to the 80, 90s, Niners. Peyton Manning's Colts, the Patriots, when, when you just know this team is coming out and winning 12 games, it's really yeah. hard to do. It's really yeah. hard to be that good consistently. Or Mahomes, Mahomes and the Chiefs have done mm -hmm. it. That, that's, that's what the Niners are doing right now. 2013, yeah. 19, 13 wins. Then you have the COVID year, 
throw it out. Yeah. Ten and then ten and seven, then thirteen and four. They're gonna win, you would think thirteen at least this year. Yeah. That's a lot of wins, man. If Kyle yeah. gets thirteen wins, I don't care if they're playing seventeen games. Thirteen wins is a lot of wins. Yeah. He has thirteen wins three times in five years. It's really impressive. It's wild. Yeah, he gets yeah. the Super Bowl and then you know he goes to the next stratosphere. So fingers crossed. Um you, you know, it's just it's a good time to be a Niners fan. You just hope the football gods are actually with them this year as opposed to against them like they have been recently. And we'll we'll see what happens. But Christmas night, Niners, Ravens. I'm gonna be really intoxicated by the time the game is on. <laughs> I cannot wait. I cannot wait. My wife's gonna be throwing me dirty looks and she's I don't even care. It is not even gonna matter at that point. Watching the game, I I, I can't wait. Yeah, I'm I'm excited. You know, my, my wife and I, when it comes to gift giving, we just essentially like send each other. Here's what I would like you to buy me and wrap, and then I'll unwrap it. But this is <laughs> this is what I want. And so I I know on Christmas Day I am unwrapping a new Niners hat and a new Niners uh, like one of the gold satin starter jackets has actually has an old. Um, uh, speaking of Super Bowls, it has that uh, Super Bowl patch from 94 on it. And so I'm just thrilled to be able to wear that as we watch the game as well. So that's, that's my not the one you, you ordered from like Saudi Arabia. Is no, it? no, no. I never the got that one. No, that was from China. Oh, that never, was from China. And it never arrived. It never arrived. And I never See, got my money back. But to be fair, it was like, I don't know, $30. So I wasn't super upset about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to watch those websites, too. Yeah, yeah, I've learned my lesson. That's for sure. All right, guys. We appreciate you. Thanks for listening. For Brian, I'm Al. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, you filthy animals. Nine is on three. One, two, three. Nine! Twenty-four hundred Sports is an Odyssey company.